Thank you. Thank you. Um, so oh, as Odashi uh, said, I do a bunch of things in this world. Uh, I'm a Muzla in my, my free time, I'm a Mozilla tech speaker, which is a program we're going to talk about more in my slides. And uh, I also volunteer for the Mozilla Reps, um, Mozilla Reps program, and I'm a mentor there. But I do like the idea of a paycheck and getting paid. Uh, so I work for Nexmo as a JavaScript developer advocate. Olya is also from Nexmo there at the back. Please say hi. Um, have you heard about Nexmo before? OK, a few of, the, a few of you. Uh, for those who haven't heard about Nexmo, we do cloud communications API. Thank you, Tomomi, for talking about us so much. Uh, Tomomi used to work with us. And uh, if you want to find out more, this is not a company sales pitch. If you want to find out more, uh, come to our booth, grab a t-shirt, please grab a t-shirt, and ask us about what we do. Um, don't take me too seriously, though. Um, I do all these things, but I also almost got ar arrested two <laughs> weeks ago uh, in New York City in a fountain while trying to pose for the mannequin piss. Uh, it, it's okay. The the officer was really understanding, and I didn't get a ticket. But I got I, I got a talk <laughs> under them, uh, and I'm part of this team of developer. Uh, advocates, community builders, event managers, basically the developer relations team at Nexmo. We're 19 right now. Yeah, it's going to stay there a while. We're 19 right now and we're growing and we're one of the big, uh, the, the biggest developer relations teams in the world. And um, everybody kind of, uh, everybody kind of wants to know how we started out. And everybody has a different story. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, how I started out. And it all started about seven years ago. And about seven years ago, I was, uh, there was this event called Open Source Open Mind in Romania. And I was, uh, I was working for Mozilla at the time. And they asked me and a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, um, to basically do a talk about Mozilla. And I was terrified of public speaking. And uh, she said, Joanna said, she'll do it. But she was traveling to the US, and she didn't have time to do slides. And she said, you know what? Can you do the slides for me? And I said, OK, I'll do slides. That's easy. Doing slides is easy. I don't have to go in front of a um, hundred and something people to talk about it. And I did the slides. And it was the morning of the event. We were supposed to travel to a different city um, to do the event. And uh, Joanna calls me, and she says, look, my flight got delayed. Uh, I might be a little late to the event. Stall. And we get to the event, and the event organizer is actually a friend and a really nice person. So she kept pushing our time slot later and later and later in the day. And it came to, to the time where it was the last time slot of the day. So someone had to go up on stage. And the event organizer was on stage, literally like this. And she was looking for Joanna in the audience. And she said, uh, and now from, from Mozilla, uh, Alex is going to come and speak about it. And it took me a while. Uh, I, I went up on stage, and I put my hands in my pocket, and I kept bouncing from one foot to the other. And it took a good minute until I started speaking. The problem was, once I started speaking, I couldn't stop. So no, no questions from the audience, no nothing. Um, and a after I finished the, the bit where I spoke, uh, there was the questions and answers part, and for every question there was, I kept going further and further and further into the audience, where at a certain point when the question and answers part finished, I was literally in the mid middle of the audience. By the time I finished with my talk, uh, Joanna actually showed up at the conference. And that was, uh, it's still recorded, it's on YouTube. Sadly, it's in Romanian. Well, not sadly, luckily, it's in Romanian. Uh, but I still use it to this day when I do my public speaking classes about uh, to, to show off as a good example of things not to do when you speak on stage. And uh, after that first thing, I said I was horrified, I was nervous, I'm never doing it again. And two weeks later, I was speaking in front of maybe 50 people again. And that's how I got started into all this. And um, going through, going through the, the seven years, because I only got hired at Nexmo last year. And uh, this is my first developer relations job. Uh, but in between that first talk 
and getting a job in developer relations, a lot of things happened. And uh, that's normal. But a bunch of people asked me, how did you do it and how do I do it? And how do I become a developer advocate, a developer evangelist? How do I get a job in developer relations? And it's really hard for me to answer that because I've had my journey. And uh, if you look online at what developer relations is, there's this guy called Phil. Um, if some of you know Phil, he happens to be my boss. You can tell him I did a really good job and I put this face on my slides. Uh, but he has this thing uh, about defining developer relations and have the industry keeps quoting Phil on what developer relations is. The only problem is Phil is really confused about developer relations because there's so much things you can do in developer relations and still be in the field. Either you're an advocate or you're an evangelist. And there's like 12 or 13 different things. And you can, he literally has this application in which you can pick and choose what you do as part of your job. And then he gives you, the application gives you at the end a title. Are you a developer advocate? Are you a developer evangelist? Are you a developer marketer? Are you doing developer experience? And it's really hard basically to tell people, oh, you do these five steps and then you're into developer relations. Um, there's uh, this guy called Josh who used to work at Algolia at a certain point, Jess in the back, uh, that says that not all the journeys are the same. From what he's seen, no two journeys to developer advocacy look the same. So successful advocates come from engineering, community building, and other disciplines too. And that's just a part of developer relations, developer advocacy. And uh, I usually tell people, look, I have no idea. I faked it, I faked it till I made it. It's easy. Uh, I'm an imposter, and I don't belong here. And then during this year, year and a half, I, um, I went to conferences a lot more than I went before I, I got this job. Because now, basically, uh, meeting people like you out into the real world is my job. I'm supposed to be the conduit between developers and product. So I get to meet a lot of people. And um, Tomomi talked about the DevRel life, about how cool and glamorous and stuff like that is. I tell you what, when you go to, like I came to Tokyo on Sunday, no, on Friday, see jet lag. Came to Tokyo on Friday and what I've seen from Tokyo so far is the ride from the airport to my hotel, which my hotel is two minutes away, the um, area around my hotel from the hotel to the venue, and I think that's about it. That's the glamour of Devra life. But it does mean I get to meet a lot of people like me, a lot of people who talk at conferences or do developer relations, and uh, it's really lonely in the, in the speaker's hotel, and you end up talking about what you do, how you got there, and stuff like that, and in the past, in the past year and a half, uh, a lot of people joined the field for the first time. So I kept asking them, so how did you get started? How did you break into developer relations? And talking to them, uh, talking to, to these people, I basically started having an idea that maybe Josh was wrong. Maybe it doesn't matter where your journey starts. Because it all goes the same way. So it doesn't matter if you hop on the first station or the second station or the third station. Everyone follows the same path into developer relations. It just differs the, the entry point. But it all goes there. Uh, it all goes there. And after I had this idea, I, obviously I spoke to people in person. There wasn't a lot of data. There wasn't a lot of science behind it. It was just my gut feeling. Um, so I started doing my like proper research. I put out a, a a survey, some sort of feedback form, in which I asked people like me how they got started, what did they do before, how did that help them. I got about 17 or 18 um, different answers from people from, uh, they were three months into their new job as developer advocates, to people who've been doing this for 30 years, which is a lot. I had no idea developer relations even was available as a position 30 years ago. So I got data from a lot of people. Uh, people who, before doing developer relations, were all kinds of things, like developers, engineers, tech writers. Um, there's even Don at the back of the room, who used to be an academic philosopher, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you for that. Uh, there's uh, ran an API developer company, marketing, undergrad 
undergrad student, public speaking is a hobby, a bunch of different things that people did before. So I figured it doesn't matter what you're doing before. It doesn't, it, there's no, oh, you have to be this little thing to be able to do developer relations. As you can get into developer relations no matter where you are in life. And uh, there's a few quotes from people who actually allowed me to use their stories on stage. Um, sadly, I don't have a name for this one, uh, but they said, I got asked to speak at an event we were sponsoring, and then I decided to try speaking at local meetups, and they found I enjoyed it. And it was the same with me. I got pushed into speaking right away, and they said I'd never do it again. Uh, but it's the same as, you were, as when you get drunk. The, the next morning, you'll say you'll never do it again until the next night. Uh, Martin, who recently joined our team, said uh, he ran a pretty large hackathon series, and uh, it helped that I had done that. Uh, he was also spending lots of time helping clients understand their developers, internally and externally, so he could better design their APIs. And this is one of the other common things uh, amongst the people who replied, is, well, I basically spent a lot of time with developers and I understand their pain. Either because I was a developer or because I had to deal with their pain. And the other, the other thing that's common for a few people is Amanda. Amanda's awesome. Amanda wears these hats on the internet. You should go find her on the internet. She's ha she has like dozens of, of hats and whenever we have a team call, she's going to wear a different hat. It's the highlight of my week. Uh, and Amanda said, tech writing helped her understand the APIs, which helped her help the users when she was at events, which is basically saying, I was, I was really, really good at what we did. I really understood what we did so I could communicate better to the outside world, which if you think at, at developer relationships, that's a little part of what you do every day. You basically uh, act as the conduit between your product and the outside world and the other way around. And uh, looking at all these stories from all these varied people, diverse, it made me think all roads lead to Rome. It doesn't matter which part of the world you start in, you end up there. You've got a few qualities or a few common things which define you. And if you've got that going for you, or if you can create that for yourself, you'll end up somewhere adjacent to developer relationships relations. And the common things I've seen at people, and it's not all of the above, so usually it's two or three of the things in there that people had before joining developer relations, and it's developer community building, or public speaking, or technical writing, or event organizing. And my, um, my last one is kind of half-baked in there because I don't know how to call them. I call them builders. But it's basically people who code for fun. People who have projects on GitHub. Uh, if you haven't joined GitHub yet, talk to Joe about it. He's really happy or Don. Um, so people who actually write code and put it up for the world to see. Because that's one way of helping. When I, when I learn something, I rarely go straight into, the, um, straight into the developer documentation and stuff like that. I work really badly with written content. But I usually go and look at code of how someone else solved this problem, and that's how I learn. Other people learn going through documentation or blog posts or videos or whatever. I learn by looking at code. And that's another way of helping out fellow developers, is by putting your code up there online so they can see. It doesn't have to be, to be this complex application, just a little snippet of code that helps me understand better. Uh, so these were the, the things that everybody who answered the survey and everybody I talked to were doing. Uh, for example, I've only did maybe three of them, not all at the same time. Uh, so I was helping Mozilla build community through the reps program. Uh, I, was, I was doing public speaking, sort of, kind of. Um, I, used to, I used to do this as a hobby, public speaking. So that meant whenever I went at the conference to speak, I would have to take vacation days to go and speak there. Uh, I was really lucky because most of the time conferences paid for my flights and hotel, or Mozilla paid for my flights and hotel, and I didn't have to spend that. Uh, but I still had to take time off. And um, I figured out I wanted to be a developer advocate. 
right around the time when I was in this company, it was the middle of May, and they wanted to go to a conference and talk. And uh, my manager said, you know what? You took 33 vacation days this year. You don't have any more vacation days. I was like, look, I'm willing to take unpaid vacation days to go to this conference and speak. I'm willing to lose money to go at this conference and meet people. And uh, he said, no, that's not available. So um, as, a, was, as an adult, what I did was go in the office the next day, quit my job, and go to the next company so I could get more vacation days so I could go and speak at the conference. I promised people I would speak. And uh, that's ar around the time I figured out I like going to conferences like this more than I like going into, into an office. And I looked at things that would help me get here that would make me better at this. And for public speaking, for example, there's a few programs online or in person which get, get you or help you get better at public speaking, uh, especially in front of a tech audience. For example, there's Mozilla Tech Speakers, and I think Flucky is going to talk about it a bit later. Uh, uh, ish. Flucky is also a Mozilla Tech Speaker, by the way, and he has a talk later about how c joining online communities or joining communities is going to help you get a job in the field. Um, and there's also Toastmasters. Uh, now, personally, I don't really approve of Toastmasters for myself. My speaking style is not suited for them. Uh, but it works for some other people. I know some really good people in the industry who started off public speaking with Toastmasters, and that's why it's there. Um, I've looked up online. There's a few chapters around Japan if you want to join. It's free. They usually meet once a month and stuff like that. Uh, Mozilla Tech Speakers is a completely online program if you want to join that. Um, I keep, I, I keep topic, talking about public speaking, weirdly enough, uh, but it's only one of the, one of the pieces of, of the puzzle. Uh, technical writing is the other big one, so either one of these, you kind of have to do one of these. Uh, and the other big one is technical writing. Now, for me, I'm really bad at technical writing. I'm really, really bad at it. And that's because I don't have a blog, or whenever I blog online, I blog for some company who erases my name from the blog post, so I can't even tell people, oh, th this is my blog post, this is how I write. Um, and my, my suggestion is, if you want to get better at this, is to start blogging. Now, my first blog posts, um, I'm actually sh ashamed to show people what I wrote because they were bad. But that meant I got better every time I wrote a new piece and a new piece and a new piece. And I got to the point where I'm not, I'm not that ashamed of what I write anymore. Um, and one of the other things that helped me get better at this as I started writing documentation. Because obviously, I have a working knowledge of how our API works, for example, or how our new API works. And trying to convey that knowledge to a fellow developer, and then sitting with them and trying to see if they get it from what I wrote, was really important for me. And it helped me uh, get better and better and better. For example, um, one, of my, uh, one of my colleagues uh, did a different thing that helped her get better at all this, and she joined the Writers Club. Now, I have no idea if Writers Clubs are popular in here. In London, they're really popular. Like, she found one within five minutes from the house, basically. Uh, but that's one other way you can get better at technical writing, or at writing in general, communicating not only via the spoken word, uh, but also through the written word. And the, the other stuff that helped me personally was community building. And now community building comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, for example, there's a program out there called Mozilla Representatives, um, which basically does this, helps you build community around Mozilla's mission. Uh, there's another one called Fedora Ambassadors, which kind of helps you do the same for Fedora. Uh, all of these are basically some sort of champions programs created by companies to recruit community members to help them scale and grow community. And that's a really good place to start. I'm pretty sure there's a few around here. Uh, like We even have Mozilla offices, for example, in, in Japan, or a community in Japan. Reach out to them, tell them you want to be involved, because that's going to help you build online communities, build developer communities. Um, there's also a thing called CodeBar. Uh, there was a talk earlier on stage about women in developer relations. 
code bar is about women in technology, uh, women in technology in general, and it offers mentorship to its members. So you get into a room and you start hacking on something real uh, for like an hour. Trying to get in there as a mentor is going to help you build communities as well. And I'm pretty sure there's other ultra local ways of building community, which I haven't figured out yet. Uh, but if you want to talk to me about it after my talk is done, please come, come find me. I'd love to talk about how people build community in Japan or in Tokyo or in this part of the world. The other stuff that um, helped help people who were starting in developer relations was event organizing. Um, it's really hard to organize a, a big event, especially an event like this one, right? Um, it's a lot of people, a lot of moving parts. You have to get the venue, and you have to get food, and you have to sell tickets, and stuff like that. It's really hard to be involved in something like this from day one or from the beginning. But I found that organizing meetups is a low barrier to entry into event organizing. Because a meetup is like 20 people or 50 people. Uh, it's only two hours. You have, don't have to worry about that much. You can find a sponsor for food and drinks, and it doesn't have to be a complete meal or, um, or stuff like that. Uh, if you go on meetup.com, there's at least, at least 15 to 20 meetups in Tokyo alone. And uh, ask one of the organizers to let you be a co-organizer with them. Everybody needs, like I organized a meetup in London with two other people, and we're all developer advocates, and we all travel the world, and we're looking always for someone else to help us out with our meetup. Everyone who's running a meetup doesn't have time for that meetup, so it's really easy for you to say, hey, I want to help, let me help, and then you'll get experience at event organizing. Um, for the builders part, I can't really offer any suggestion other than build stuff. See what happens. Um, it's, there's no recipe for that. Just put it up somewhere online where other people can see it and collaborate in it, and that's it, basically. Um, I saw this developer relations, this path into developer relations, as a cherry blossom. And each petal is a different thing. Now, if you want a beautiful cherry blossom, or if you want to blossom into that, you have to do a bit of everything. Uh, but on your way to developer relations, on your way to getting there, you basically need two of those. Pick two that you think you're good at or is easier to start or you're comfortable with or stuff like that. Pick two and then, well, apply for open positions. Um, these are the people who filled the survey and said they wanted to, they, they allowed me to use their pictures on stage. And I want to thank them a lot for, um, for filling in the survey. It helped me get a clearer picture of how people get into developer relations. And it's not magic. It's not voodoo. Um, it's not, oh, everybody has the, their own path. It's actually um, all the people in this slide had a few of those, th th those things in common. Um, as I said, if you want to try or if you want to join developer relations, I actually have a question. Who in the room is doing developer relations right now? It has a developer relations role. OK, so maybe half the room. That means half the room wants to get into developer relations or wants to find out more about developer relations. Um, if you want to find out more, I, I'm going to be around today. Or if you, you're, you think you're ready and you have some of the things in there and you're ready to apply to your first job, well, Nexmo's hiring. Uh, if you go to developer.nexmo.com slash team, you'll see we're, uh, we're hiring and we have a few open positions around. Uh, with that, I'm going to make a fool of myself and try to say domo arigato gozaimashu.